bit closer. Okay, here we go, a big one. Off the ground, one more. Given popular depictions of the Apollo lunar missions, one might get the impression that the astronauts spent most of their time on the lunar surface planting flags and delivering profound That's one small step for man, one giant leap for mankind. And not so profound speeches. I was strolling on the moon one day in a merry, merry month of December. Now, May, May. In reality, the astronauts' EVAs were rigorously scheduled down to the minute and involved a long list of scientific tasks, mainly collecting mineral specimens for geologists to examine back on Earth. However, as scientists wanted to study the moon's geology and environment long term, the astronauts were also tasked with deploying a variety of automatic scientific instruments on the lunar surface. These were collectively known as the Apollo Lunar Surface Experiment Package, or LSEP. Developed by the Bendix Corporation, LSEP was not a single scientific instrument, but rather a modular data collection and transmission system which could be customized to fit the scientific requirements of each Apollo mission. The design requirements for LSEP were challenging. Not only did the system have to operate independently and reliably for years in the harsh lunar environment, but also be lightweight enough to be carried aboard the lunar module and simple enough for the astronauts to deploy in their bulky spacesuits. The most pressing environmental hazards were the large temperature extremes on the lunar surface and the accumulation of lunar dust, or regolith, which could potentially clog scientific instruments and cover solar panels. For the sake of simplicity and reliability, thermal regulation was accomplished via sunshades, mylar thermal blankets, thermal coatings, and electrical resistance heaters, while dust was abated by strategically placed dust covers and nickel-63 radioactive sources to dissipate static charge. The LSEP system comprised three main modules, the Central Station, the RTG, and the Peripheral Experimental Modules. The Central Station housed all the power converter, signal processing circuitry, and radio transmitters needed to collect, process, and transmit data from the experiment modules back to Earth. The station used the same unified S-band system as the lunar module, and transmitted via a 58cm long axial helical antenna. To avoid the inevitable power degradation from dust accumulation on solar panels, LSEP was powered by a SNAP-27 radioisotope thermoelectric generator, or RTG. Developed by Sandia National Laboratories, SNAP-27 was a metal canister with radiator fins measuring 46 centimeters long by 46 centimeters wide and containing 3.8 kilograms of plutonium-238. The radioactive decay of the plutonium generated 1,250 watts of thermal power, which was converted via thermocouples into 70 watts of electrical power at 30 volts DC. LSEP was carried in the scientific equipment, or SEQ bay, of the lunar module descent stage in two sub pallets. The first sub pallet held the central station and the majority of the experiment modules, while the second held the RTG, antenna gimbal, lunar hand tool carrier, and a third sub-pallet with one to two experiment modules. Plutonium fuel capsule for the RTG was stored separately in a special cask mounted on the left-hand side of the SEQ, and it had to be manually extracted and inserted into the RTG. This was a safety measure designed to prevent plutonium from being scattered in the event a launch was aborted and the lunar module re-entered the Earth's atmosphere. Indeed, this is exactly what happened during Apollo 13, when the astronauts were forced to use their lunar module Aquarius as a lifeboat to carry them back to Earth. Aquarius's RTG cast survived the heat of re-entry as designed and now lies at the bottom of the Tonga Trench in the South Pacific. To date, no release of radioactivity has been detected from the cast, which is expected to safely contain its payload for at least 870 years. The peripheral experiment modules were selected in 1966 and designed by specialists from a variety of institutions, including NASA's Ames Research Center, Jet Propulsion Laboratory and Marshall Space Flight Center, the U.S. Geological Survey, Columbia, Yale, Rice and Stanford Universities, and MIT. In total, 16 different experiments were deployed on the Moon over six successful lunar landing missions. However, even the simplest version of the system was expected to take up to two hours to deploy far too long for the first lunar landing mission, Apollo 11, which included only a single 2-hour and 40-minute EVA. Bendix was thus tasked with developing a simplified scientific package that could be deployed in under 10 minutes, known as the Early Apollo Scientific Experiments Package, or ESAP. ESAP was not technically a simplified version of LSEP, but rather a pair of standalone scientific instruments. The first of these was the Laser Ranging Retroreflector, or LRRR, 
a 46 centimeter square array of corner retro reflectors which reflected any incoming light back towards its source. By shining a laser beam from the Earth at the retro reflector, the total time of flight could be used to calculate the distance between the Earth and the Moon within one centimeter, an accuracy which has been likened to measuring the distance between New York and Los Angeles within the width of a human hair. The first LRRR data was obtained by Lick Observatory on August 1, 1969, just a week after Apollo 11 returned to Earth. Two more retro reflectors were deployed by the Apollo 14 and 15 missions, and all three are still in use, the only part of any of the LSEP packages still currently functioning. The second ESEP instrument was the Passive Seismic Experiment Package, or PSEP, a standalone version of the later Passive Seismic Experiment, or PSE, with its own solar power source and data transmission equipment. Both instruments were designed to detect natural seismic activity, or moonquakes, as well as the propagation of man-made seismic signals through the lunar interior. Such signals were generated by crashing spent hardware such as the Lunar Module Ascent Stage, or the S-4B Rocket Stage, into the lunar surface. The detector itself was housed in a 23cm diameter beryllium enclosure mounted on a motor-driven gimbal to keep it leveled. This enclosure contained four magnetically damped mass and spring seismometers, one aligned north-south, one east-west, and two vertically. For thermal regulation, the whole instrument was covered in a large mylar thermal blanket and fitted with a 2.5-watt electrical heater for use at night. Unfortunately, the Apollo 11 PSEP failed after only 21 days. Proper lunar seismic data would not be collected until after Apollo 12, four months later. Apollo 12 was the first mission to carry a full LSAP, and a series of photographs taken by astronauts Pete Conrad and Alan Bean clearly illustrate the full procedure for deploying the system. The first step was to open the SEQ bay and lower the two main sub pallets to the lunar surface. This is accomplished by a system of cloth tapes, pulleys, and booms. While the system was designed to make the operation less strenuous, the astronauts found it cumbersome and slow to use, and preferred simply to lift the sub pallets out of the SEQ bay by hand. A relatively easy task in one sixth Earth's gravity. Once the sub pallets were lowered, the next step was to transfer the plutonium fuel capsule from the cask to the RTG. This procedure involved two specialized tools the dome removal tool, used to open the cask, and the fuel transfer tool, used to pull the fuel capsule out of the cask and insert it into the RTG. On Apollo 12, Alan Bean discovered that the fuel capsule had become stuck in the cask due to thermal expansion. Pete Conrad proceeded to pound on the cask with a hammer while Bean worked the capsule loose, eventually managing to extract it and fuel the RTG. The next task was to carry the LSET modules to the selected deployment site. This was typically done using the Universal Handling Tool, or UHT, a long-handled device with a special trigger-actuated connector head used by the astronauts for everything from carrying equipment to positioning instruments, turning bolts, and as a handle extension for sample collection tools. The two heaviest sub-packages could be connected and transported using a special carry bar, which doubled as the mass for the central station antenna gimbal. One major challenge the designers of the LSEP faced was how to secure the various sub-pallets in the SEQ bay and to each other in a manner that would resist loosening by vibration, but would be easy for the astronauts to release. This is accomplished using special fasteners called Boyd bolts, patented in 1968 by inventor Thomas Boyd. Void bolts use a combination of spring tension and interfacing ratchet plates to prevent them from being loosened by vibration, but required only a quarter turn to release and automatically extracted themselves. This made them easy to unfasten using the UHT, a useful feature as the LSEP central station alone featured 12 void bolts, which all had to be released before it would spring up to its full height. Once all the experiment modules were laid out and deployed, all that remained was to connect them and the RTG to the central station using cables, align and calibrate the instruments as required, and align the LSEP antenna towards the Earth, the latter task being accomplished using a sun compass mounted on the antenna gimbal. The Apollo 12 LSEP included six experiments, including the aforementioned Passive Seismic Experiment, or PSE. On November 20, 1969, this instrument conducted the first active lunar seismic experiment when the ascent stage of Apollo 12's lunar module, Intrepid, was crashed into the lunar surface. The second Apollo 12 experiment was the Dust, Thermal, and Radiation Engineering Measurements Experiment, or DTRAN. This is mounted on top of the central station and consisted of three small horizontally mounted solar cells. Accumulation of lunar dust, as well as damage from micrometeorites and cosmic rays, was measured by the steady degradation of the cell's power output. A simplified version of DTRAN had also flown on Apollo 11, attached to the PSAP. 
The third Apollo 12 experiment was the Lunar Surface Magnetometer, or LSM, which measured the Moon's magnetic field and its interaction with the Earth's magnetic field. The fourth experiment was the Solar Wind Spectrometer, or SWS, an array of seven Faraday cups for capturing and measuring the charge of ions. One cup was oriented vertically and the six others at 60 degree angles in order to measure the strength of the solar wind in all directions. Finally, the fifth and sixth experiments mounted on the same module with a superthermal ion detector or SIDE and the cold cathode ion gauge or CCIG. These instruments were similar in function, being used to detect and analyze charged ions floating around the lunar surface. The CCIG was the more sophisticated of the two, with five C-channel and one helical channel electron multiplier for collecting and classifying ions. SIDE was a simpler instrument using ion detection to measure the pressure of the extremely thin lunar atmosphere. It was so sensitive that by Apollo 15, the astronauts had taken to calibrating it using oxygen vented from the lunar module, typically parked a couple hundred meters away. To prevent the instrument from accumulating charge, which could interfere with measurements, it was placed on a spiderweb-like grounding net. Originally, SIDE was to be housed in the same casing as CCIG, but the powerful magnet used in CCIG interfered with its operation. It was thus placed in a separate housing connected to the CCIG by a ribbon cable. Unfortunately, residual tension in this cable, plus the shifting of the grounding net, tended to knock one or both instruments out of alignment, to the endless frustration of the astronauts trying to set it up. Thus, for Apollo 15, a short boom was added to connect the two modules and prevent them from falling over. As well as another PSE, Apollo 13 carried a standalone version of the CCIG called the Cold Cathode Gauge Experiment, or CCGE, as well as two new experiments, the Heat Flow Experiment, or HFE, and the Charged Particle Lunar Environment Experiment, or CPLE. The CPLE was an ion detector similar to SIDE, while the HFE was intended to measure the transmission of heat through the moon's interior and determine whether radioactive decay within the lunar crust or mantle contributed to its interior temperature. This experiment required the astronauts to drill two 3-meter deep boreholes into the lunar surface and insert a pair of thermal probes. However, as Apollo 13 did not land on the moon, none of these instruments were deployed, and the CCGE was not flown on any subsequent Apollo mission. Apollo 14's LSEP was very similar to Apollo 13's, minus the CCGE and with the addition of another laser-ranging retroreflector and the Active Seismic Experiment, or ASE. The ASE comprised a series of three geophones laid out in a line from a central electronics module. Seismic signals were generated using one of two devices. The first was the Thumper, a staff-like device whose head contained 22 small explosive charges called Single Bridgewire Apollo Standard Initiators. The astronaut selected the desired charge using a dial, then pressed a pressure plate in the head firmly into the ground to fire the charge. A ribbon cable connecting the thumper to the ASC provided a reference signal for timing the reflection of the seismic wave. The second device was a small mortar designed to launch rocket-propelled bombs to distances of 150, 300, 900, and 1500 meters after the astronauts had left the lunar surface. This experiment proved troublesome for the crew of Apollo 14, as the ideal location for the mortar was blocked by a crater, forcing it to be placed closer to the LSEP central station than planned. This raised concerns that dust kicked up by the launching bombs would coat the other instruments and interfere with their operation, so the mortar was never fired. Commander Alan Shepard also only managed to fire 13 of the Thumper 22 charges due to lunar dust getting into the initiator switches. Other problems included residual tension in the cables pulling the geophones out of the ground, and the geophones being so sensitive that Lunar Module Pilot Edgar Mitchell was forced to stand still while Shepard operated the thumper, reducing his productivity. Apollo 15's LSEP included a laser-ranging retroreflector three times larger than the Apollo 11 and 14 versions, a side CCIG with the aforementioned connecting boom, and a solar wind spectrometer, passive seismic experiment, heat flow experiment, and a lunar surface magnetometer. The heat flow experiment proved especially troublesome, with Commander David Scott only managing to drill down to half the required depth. The probes could thus only be partially inserted, limiting their usefulness. Trouble with the HFE struck again on Apollo 16 when Commander John Young accidentally tripped and ripped out a cable connecting the experiment to the central station. While Bendix determined it was possible to repair the damage, Mission Control decided the astronaut's time was better spent elsewhere, and the experiment was abandoned. More successful was the active seismic experiment, which featured a mortar tube with a redesigned base. Three bombs were fired before a sensor indicated the tube was out of alignment, leading to the fourth shot being abandoned. 
The final Apollo mission, Apollo 17, finally succeeded in fully implanting the heat flow experiment probes into the lunar surface. The mission's LSEP also included four brand new experiments. The Lunar Seismic Profiling Experiment, or LSPE, was similar to the active seismic experiment, but was conducted over a longer distance, allowing measurements to be made deeper into the lunar interior. But instead of a mortar or thumper, the LSPE used a set of eight hand-placed explosive charges to generate a seismic signal. These charges, which varied in weight from 57 grams to 2.7 kilograms, were deployed at intervals stretching out to 3.5 kilometers using the lunar roving vehicle. The charges were armed by pulling out three safety pins and could detonate either at preset delays ranging from 89 to 93 hours, or by radio command from an antenna on the LSP electronics package. The second new experiment on Apollo 17 was the Lunar Atmospheric Composition Experiment, or LACE, a more sophisticated version of the cold cathode ion gauge used to identify the ionic components of the lunar atmosphere. While the third was the Lunar Ejecta and Meteorites Experiment, or LEAM. This was designed to measure the influx of cosmic dust, micrometeorites, and ejecta thrown up by meteorites impacting the lunar surface. Its three detectors, oriented east, west, and upwards, were essentially ultra-sensitive microphones made of thin quartz membranes sandwiched between charged beryllium and copper mesh. These sensors were protected from dust thrown up by the ascending lunar module, or the LSP seismic charges, by cover plates which could be jettisoned by mission control by radio command. Unfortunately, LEAM returned unusual results, calling into question the validity of its data. The last and most ambitious experiment deployed by Apollo 17 was a or LSG. This was designed to detect minute variations in the Moon's gravitational field and potentially detect the gravitational waves predicted by Einstein's theory of general relativity. The mechanism consisted of a sensitive balance beam kept horizontal by a pair of opposing springs and a special mass addition calibration system. However, a manufacturing error resulting from an incorrect value for lunar gravitational acceleration made it impossible to level the beam, and the experiment could not be made to work as intended. Several other experiments were also conducted separately from the LSAPs. For example, Apollo 11 carried a lunar surface camera, which captured stereo pairs of the lunar surface to allow geologists to work out soil composition. Apollos 11 to 16 also deployed the Solar Wind Composition Experiment, a long strip of metal foil mounted on a pole designed to capture high energy solar particles. Apollo 16 and 17 deployed similar experiments called the Cosmic Ray Detector, a long strip of foil covered Lexan which detected high energy particles by the microscopic tracks they left in the plastic. Apollo 14 and 16 carried a tripod mounted Lunar Portable Magnetometer, or LPM, to measure the Moon's magnetic field at multiple locations while a portable traverse gravimeter, or PTG, was attached to the back of Apollo 17's lunar roving vehicle to measure the moon's gravitational field at each scheduled geology stop. Finally, Apollo 17 carried a neutron probe designed to be inserted into a 2.5 meter deep borehole. This was designed to measure the overturn or mixing rate of the lunar regolith. When cosmic rays strike the regolith, they release free neutrons which penetrate deeper into the soil, where they can be captured by other atoms and convert them into radioisotopes. The deeper such isotopes are found below the surface, the faster the soil turnover rate. While certain experiments like the CPLE worked intermittently due to overheating, most of the LSEP experiments returned good data until September 30, 1977, when all support operations were terminated. While this was mainly done for budgetary reasons, by this time the RTG output had degraded to the point where it could no longer power both the LSEP instruments and the data transmitters. The LSEP control room was also needed for an attempt to reactivate the dormant Skylab space station. Despite their short life and the various difficulties encountered in their deployment, the six LSEPs returned a wealth of valuable data that greatly advanced humanity's knowledge of the Moon's structure and geological history. For example, the LRRRs revealed that the Moon is receding from the Earth at a rate of 3.8 centimeters per year, while the passive and active seismic experiments confirmed the likely existence of a molten lunar mantle. They also revealed that the moon resonates or rings like a bell when subjected to large impacts. However, a full discussion of the scientific discoveries made possible by LSEP and other Apollo experiments is far beyond the scope of this video. I'm Jean Messier from Our Own Devices. Thanks for watching and have a great day.